um, I, I'm part of the uh, Massachusetts Sex Worker Ally Network, um, and I am also uh, I advise the South Asia Worker Center, which works with Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, uh, and Nepali uh, women, mostly uh, living in public housing in the Boston area. Um, so I'm I'm happy to talk about any of that as our conversation moves forward. Um, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to hear what you say in particular, especially about AIDS and um, sex workers and how that kind of interacts with everything we're talking about today. But um, next up, Anjali Andrade Ecker, would you like to um, introduce yourself? Yes, uh, Jay Beam, everybody. And um, thank you for inviting me. A big, huge congratulations to Gauri on her wonderful book. If you have any money, if you don't have money, borrow and buy her book. It will be fabulous. I've had the pleasure of watching her blossom into the incredible intellectual that she is. And I look forward to saying the same about all of you who are here. Um, I'm sort of an elder here, so I will take that role on with great um, joy. My name, as, as uh, Iggy said, is Anjali Arundekar. I am a professor of feminist studies at UC Santa Cruz. I also direct a new Center for South Asia Studies, which is focused on economic, social, and feminist justice. And we have been doing a lot of work um, along with the farmers' protest, queer rights, anti-casteism, and more. And I'm happy to say more about it towards the end. Um, I'm a historian of caste and sexuality. And normally, I would begin with a dirty joke, but I couldn't think of one that would be appropriate for our conversation. But, but the, the day is still young, and I'm sure I can come up with something. Um, so I write about uh, the 18th and 19th century, and I'm sort of interested in how the language of history is always a place of politics, particularly for minoritized bodies. Now, unlike Gauri, um, I sort of have a split personality in that I grew up in Bombay or Mumbai in Maharashtra. I am a Bahujan person and I came to the United States for my graduate studies. So I have sort of a split intellectual activist affective relationship both to South Asia and to where I live right now in Los Angeles, California. And sort of my work has really been, um, particularly in the last decade, where um, sort of the rise of the Modi government, and I want to say a little bit more about how that should be central to our conversations, because the relationship of us in the diaspora to those who live and survive in South Asia is no longer one of distance. It is intimately connected. And I think it's important for us um, you know, to think about it. So I think about history and history to me is a live um, sort of complex feel that is not just the property of historians. If you look at what's going on here, for example, I want to salute the students of Cal State who have managed to make caste uh, a protected category in uh, the, uh, the CU system. And we are trying to do the same in the UC system. That is a historical project, right? They're basically saying, look, if we're gonna think about Black Lives Matter, if we're gonna think about minoritization, if we're going to think about queer trans um, rights, we need to also think about caste, which is as central to those questions as anything else. And I will say more about the importance of thinking about caste, particularly for your generation and all, especially in the moment in which we live in. Uh, and again, I'll say more when uh, Iggy has crafted a very deft set of questions for us, and I will do my best to answer them as we move forward, but I'm delighted to see all of you and please looking forward to all the questions you will ask. Thank you so much. And um, it's really exciting to have another person based in California on this panel. So um, go banana slugs. And also to introduce the second person with um, cool glasses on this panel, Rashka Mutha Kumar, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hey y'all, I'm Raksha. I use um, she, her pronouns. I'm based in New York currently. Um, ooh, thank you. Yes, I am a purple fiend. Everything in my apartment is purple. <laughs> um, I, I grew up a lot in the South and my background is as a, I guess, youth organizer is like predominantly the, the work and the spaces that I've been in. So in North Carolina, in high school, I was doing a lot of like sex education, queer sex education work in a, you know, in a state that didn't really offer any good sex education for anybody, regardless of gender and sexuality. So that was kind of where I got my start in, in kind of activism and organizing work. And then in college, I kind of carried that on and got really involved with like our Pride Alliance and queer resources. 
I went to Georgia Tech in Atlanta and we didn't have any LGBT center or like any campus allocation for queer students. So um, we as students were kind of offering all the resources that were on campus. And in hindsight, that was it, like super wild. Like I was 20 years old offering basically like full peer counseling services around my academic career to, to the students. And then in, in my senior year of college, we, we had a rash of um, queer student suicides and we did a ton of organizing work around that. We actually had our president of our campus Pride Alliance was shot and killed by our campus police officers. And then subsequently my, my best friend who was a black trans woman um, died shortly after that. And so that's kind of like been my, my long organizing journey as like, you know, I, I started at 15, but even at like 25, I feel like this old veteran, uh, like grizzled veteran of the movement. It feels like I've been queer organizing for so long with, with my peers. And, and now I'm in New York. So I moved up from the South for, for work here. I'm a software engineer. And now I've been doing lots of like kind of diversity in tech stuff and also labor organizing in, in the tech space. So um, at, I work at Google and we just launched our union a couple of months ago, which is like one of the first unions at a large tech company, at a tech company in general. And we've been doing a lot of um, kind of all this kind of advocacy work that has been mentioned already. We actually did a cast um, informational session, like a cast allyship session on Thursday with our whole union because it's becoming such a, I mean, it always has been such a relevant issue, but now people want to learn more about it. And we've been really pushing that with the union. Um, a lot of our leadership is actually queer South Asians. It's been just kind of by coincidence. And we've been really um, kind of finding the intersection of the labor movement and, and all of our advocacy and our backgrounds. So that's been kind of a new exciting journey for me as, as kind of like a young professional. So yeah, that's my background. I'm an organizer. <laughs> Thank you so much for introducing yourself, Rashka. Um, I'm really excited to have you here. Um, since you like got your start in like college activism, I think a lot of us here can like really learn a lot from you. So thank you all again for um, agreeing to come to this panel and speak on it. So um, I have prepared a list of questions to ask you guys and anyone in the chat, if you wanna ask a question, you can DM Saki and he will send them to me and I will ask them for you. So the first couple of questions I have is um, directed towards everyone on this panel. So you guys can all um, speak up and say um, what you want. So my first question is, everyone on this panel today has spoken about like gender and queerness within our South Asian culture and like kind of the history of trans people in India, other South Asian countries or like um, queerness and gender within our like diaspora um, communities. Could you um, elaborate on your work or like what you think of it and um, kind of has learning that history helped you with your own growth in gender understanding and also how do you think we can start talking about this history in our own brown communities? Because oftentimes it's kind of hard to approach that topic with um, our South Asian peers. Um, yeah, I can, I can start on that topic. So I always, I think something that really defined the early part of my organizing life was um, that a lot of these progressive spaces, especially in the South and stuff were like extremely white dominated. There wasn't a lot of South Asian organizers in the South doing this like sex education or queer organizing work. And so in a way, in my mind, I always felt like I kind of had to choose between being in South Asian spaces or queer spaces. And I had to like divide these parts of my identity. And it was like, here's when I do this thing, here's when I do the other thing. And it's only been really since moving to New York that it's been, I've found spaces where I can do both of those things where there are so many radical queer South Asian organizers or radical caste organizers, things like that. And that's been really interesting. Um, I actually have this book that I got in the end of college. It's, it's a zine that I ordered from India and my friend brought it back for me. It's called For the Love of God. And it's like, it's just this like series of Hindu myths retold with like different artists and authors from their kind of like a queer lens. So different reincarnations that might've changed gender across their reincarnation or mythology about like the sun and moon who had different genders, things like that. And I think I've really 
gone through a big journey in the past couple of years of trying to find everything that I can that's in the intersection. And I, I think it makes such a huge difference when you can kind of relate it to our own cultural background, like being able to talk to, a, to my parents about it and explore these mythology that I grew up with and be like, oh, I remember that story. Do you, what do you think about this aspect? I think has been kind of a really profound experience for me and my own ability to communicate it with my, with my family. Um, should I go next, Gauri, or do you want to go next? Um, thank you, Raksha. Um, um, I have an engineering undergraduate degree, and I am a humanist, so there is hope for you as well. <laughs> but uh, I'm delighted to meet you and hear about the rabble rousing you are doing with the corporate, you know, wankers, as we say. But um, so I was thinking a lot about what I would say because my experience spanned different decades of living in different places. I came out, I'm 53 years old. I came out to my parents when I was 18 year old in Bombay and did not know a single gay person in the world. Uh, but there was a small group of lesbians at that time called Sri Sangam who were organizing and I had managed to find them. Now, the reason why I'm telling the story because the story is almost counterintuitive. Um, I, as I said before, I am from a lower caste Bahujan community. My grandmothers were Devadasis, was, you know, sex workers, courtesans. My parents are the first to be legally married. So sexuality was a non-issue. But I'm saying this to you because there are different ways in which people come into queerness. And sexuality is not always the story which embraces queerness. So when I came out to my parents, um, you know, my father and my mother were completely sort of supportive. Again, they didn't quite understand what it meant, but sexuality was never something that was a struggle. What was a struggle for me growing up and continues to be, and was at least, especially when I was growing up in Mumbai, was more my masculinity and my caste, right? So, so I think in many ways being, and I think that that applies even today, even though we've made lots of changes and I'll say more about more contemporary things that are going on, particularly in India vis-a-vis -vis organizing and the challenges that, that you know, uh, casteism is placing to particularly those who are organizing. So it is easier in some ways to, to come out as, as a gay person but it is not as easier to come out as a masculine person. And you could be a masculine person who's not gay or queer or trans or non-binary. So I think one of the challenges, and I think one of the important things that my parents taught me was that uh, minoritization comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And what that means is that we have to recognize and support all those shapes and sizes, right? Um, um, so as a good Indian, I have an engineering background, but I also did do engineering, but I also love maths and I'm queer. And as Raksha is, you know, so there are all kinds of folks and, and, and generations. So I wanna sort of give you the long haul of it is that the assumption that just if you foster queer community, there will necessarily be progressive politics is not always the case, right? And this is especially true in India, particularly in the last three decades when there has been more, more activism. The second thing I wanna also sort of talk about is that um, we have to be really cautious. And then I say we, we who live in the diaspora, I spend half my time in India, and those of us who live between worlds or live in one world, is that we have to really resist the seduction of a queer positive politics that erases or elides other histories of oppression, right? So I'm gonna give you two examples. One is the Indian state, which as we know is a Hindu right authoritarian fascist state. There is no equivocation about that, right? Uh, produces language laws that ostensibly support trans rights uh, eradicate the oppression of queers, but continually oppress and eradicate Muslims, Dalits, Bahujans, and other minority subjects, right? So the two things, which may seem paradoxical, exist very happily with each other, right? And so there are pride marches that happen all over India all the time, even during the pandemic. But if you go to a pride march with a sign that says queer azadi, which means you are expressing your support for Kashmir, which in fact happened in 2019 at a march that I attended, you will get arrested as being anti-national, right? So I think we are, uh, I'll stop because I can feel like I'm going into my preacher mode now, but um, I just wanna say that we have to be really sort of robust and embrace a much more capacious understanding of what it means to be queer, even as we support each other and tell each other our stories. So I'll stop there.
Yeah, I'll just jump in there because I think a lot of what um, what I a lot of what I would have said to, said to this question has already been said. But I think um, one of the things that we see happening in Indian activist spaces right now is that um, is exactly the fact that um, that queer politics can be tethered to a really wide variety of formations and that we cannot assume that they are going to be liberatory or anti-fascist formations. And so, um, so keeping our sort of attention on how struggles are interconnected is important. And I'd say this even in relation to some like kind of obvious victories that we've seen in the last decade, um, for example, Section 377 being overturned when we see that on the ground, even now, um, sex workers, especially um, especially transgender sex workers, especially Dalit Bahujan sex workers, especially Muslim sex workers, still bear the brunt of policing. Uh, and they're just policed under different laws that don't specifically relate to sexuality, but they're policed under anti-trafficking laws or public nuisance laws. Um, and, so, uh, and so keeping those kind of different dynamics uh, in, in view is important. Um, but I also, I want to come back to the kind of question of uh, history and how we can sort of think history um, uh, in our own communities, which I, I, I think is a really generative question. Um, and I've thought about this because I'm not a historian, but I teach a course uh, with a historian, which actually um, I see Vidisha is here and Vidisha has actually taken that class. So maybe you can say more about it. But one of the things that we've really struggled with in that class actually is sort of thinking about how to talk about history. And we've and we've read um, Anjali's work in that class. Um, and, and, and one of the things we talked about in that class is sort of how to, to read history as a way of understanding kind of what, um, what's been suppressed and also what dynamics are generative of the conditions we're living in without kind of fetishizing history or sort of trying to locate ourselves in history as a way of necessarily kind of uh, sanctioning our existence today. And, um, you know, when we start the class, we read a, a piece by Nayan Shah, which is, um, which, which makes this argument, right, that, um, that uh, we're here now and, and history is not the only justification for us being here now. Um, on the question of sort of how to talk about this history in our own communities, I mean, I think like I'm really inspired by work like the work Raksha is doing, right? Because part of what you're doing is talking about um, these issues in the spaces you're in, right? Uh, and not uh, and not sort of segmenting them off from the rest of your life, right? So you know you're in a tech workplace and you are working to change conditions in that workplace. And I think a lot of us sort of participate in a lot of communities, and to the extent that it's safe for us, you know, we are able to kind of uh, move the needle on certain conversations without compartmentalizing different parts of our lives. I know that for me, one of the ways that I'm often called upon to do that is the fact that I am from um, a Savarna dominant caste background. Um, I have a lot of family and relatives who are um, uh, who, who have Hindutva right-wing fascist sympathies. Uh, and when they're not trolling me on so social media or circulating uh, dangerous, murderous uh, memes on, on, social, uh, on, on WhatsApp, um, you know, they, they are interacting as though, you know, everything is normal with me, right, in these spaces of privilege. And so one of the places that I think, um, you know, people who share my particular positionality can be doing is sort of bringing those conversations there as well. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, like, I really also understand what um, the points Anjali brought up, like about uh, kind of like the intersection of like masculinity with people who are assigned female at birth or like who kind of lean into that feminine spectrum. I feel like as a brown person growing up in America, sometimes we often are pressured to be hyper feminine. And if you kind of are not that, you get excluded from your own communities, even though like they were supposed to welcome you. But kind of like jumping off that point, um, in intro introductions, you guys all talked about how you started. So I kind of want to go back to that. And so all of you do a lot of advocacy work that kind of relates back to queer and feminist politics. So how did you get your start in this type of work? And also kind of bouncing off that, have you faced any personal struggles from within your own community because of your work? Uh, maybe I'll start because, you know, I have to be stopped since I have um, 
a longer history of this, so I'll try to keep it short. I think for me, um, being political about my minoritization was never a choice. I grew up in a community called the Gomantak Mahara Samaj, which was forged out of a history of community. They are the only Devadasi community that have their own archives. I've just finished a whole book on them. And so the choice of being political was never an issue. What was uh, something that I learned from the, the very beginning, and I think that has informed my politics, is that um, is how histories of sexuality can be places of um, teaching and learning for other histories, right? So it's one thing to say, oh, everything's connected, right? You know, race is about class, class is about gender, gender is about sexuality. Yes, all of, all of that is true, but what happens if we don't add sexuality as something that's missing to a story, but rather start with sexuality as the story that allows us to tell other stories, right? So my intellectual and activist life has not necessarily been only with queer organizations. I was part of Salga when it formed in New York, Tricone in San Francisco and in Philadelphia. So yes, or even Desh Pardesh, if there are any Canadians out here. So that history is very well documented, but I think the, the history that I'm more um, proud of and that I continue to be engaged is, is the work that I've done with uh, working class women, trans people who are not necessarily defined primarily by their sexual orientation or their gender orientation, but more by their labor. And I think this is where Gauri and I intersect a little bit, right? So as I said, for most of these women, um, sexuality is not, uh, is, has not been the site of contestation. The ability to survive, to escape police prosecution, to be able to walk out into the streets without being um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, cast into language of humiliation, et cetera, has been that. So I think for me, that has been very, very important from the very get go, right? So if I am in India, if I say my surname, as Gauri's surname will also tell a story, your surnames tell a history of caste oppression. Right, so my surname is Arun Dekar. My face is not a Savarna face, but people in my community are very light skinned because they had bio fathers who were Savarna, right? But your surname is gives you away. So, in many ways, I grew up being very careful when someone said, What is your name? Right, and I said Arun Dekar, the first thing they would say, Oh, you're from the Gomanta Karta Samaj, right? So, so there was a sort of uh, belligerence that I grew up with, which was about caste. So when it came to sexuality, it was almost like I was ready to go, right? There was no, no, no drama about that. So the reason I'm bringing that up is that, you know, the difficulty, the story of coming out is not always the story of coming out about your sexuality. The story is about coming out in a way in which sexuality is one piece of that very, very, very big story. Let me stop there because I want to hear from my comrades about their investments in this question. Yeah, I mean, I think this, the question is about sort of how we got involved in advocacy, but, you know, it's necessarily also about sort of our personal trajectories and, and how we come to understand ourselves. So, you know, for me, I'll say that, you know, I grew up in white suburbia um, in a very close knit community of Indian American families who were the ones that had migrated to that town where I lived uh, and we're still you know very close today and it's a community that I'm still very invested in uh, and I grew up mainly with sort of racial exclusion as my understanding of, of where I sort of fit into the world um, and that was kind of my you know, the, the, the main way of understanding my life um, and it, it wasn't really until much later in life that I came to understand how much caste and class privilege also shaped my life and it really took kind of I think some, you know, ongoing and serious work to see that because it wasn't, um, it wasn't made explicit to me when I was growing up. Um, but one of the things, a couple of kind of events for me that were key in my politicization, I think one was um, the, the wave of anti-South Asian violence after 9-11 which both made me think about, you know, as I was experiencing some of that as a young person, but also, um, also seeing how um, 
Islamophobia played out in my communities. Uh, and around the same time, I really started to see sort of the rise of Hindutva um, uh, ideology in a, in a different kind of consolidated way um, in my communities. And it was happening in sort of really institutionalized, organized ways uh, and ways that were often kind of pushing people apart. And I came to learn we're actually very key in sort of circuits of resources for Hindutva politics um, in India. And so I think those kind of two dynamics were really important for me and how I came to see how I fit into the world and how I couldn't kind of absolve myself of um, my investment in, um, in, in South Asian uh, uh, political life, um, even as I was experiencing. And I think, you know, for many of, of you who may sort of feel like, okay, well, I just kind of want to focus on what, what I'm doing right here and right now. Um, you know, for me, it just became clear that those two things were actually very connected and I couldn't separate them out. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll stop with that. Um, yeah, I think I talked a little bit about my background with being in the South and kind of like the um, internal conflict slash like internalized racism around around like queer identity and and like dividing up my spaces. Um, I think a really formative experience for me in in kind of bringing it all together into a more intersectional lens is that uh, after college, I really wanted to to live in the place that I was born. I was born in Chennai, India, but I never really lived there. So I took an internship with an NGO that it mostly gets funding for AIDS advocacy, but they do, it, it is predominantly like an LGBT uh, organization that works with trans women and does public health in, in villages in Tamil Nadu. And I think that was a really profound experience for me in the sense of kind of bringing it all together. Um, like Anjali said, like there was pride parades all over and there was, there was this like veneer of, of to an extent like in the big cities that there is a degree of what is acceptable in queerness. Like my, my work wasn't challenged. People were like, oh, okay, yeah, you're coming from abroad and you're doing this NGO work. That's so like charitable of you. But what, what does that like actually mean for what the communities are, are experiencing in these marginalized spaces and like what the government is doing to to further marginalize people and when when can families leverage the power of like police to to target their own children who are like you know running away to live their truth or, or different things I think it was a really eye-opening experience of like kind of all the layers that I think were missing from my I guess just my knowledge just living in the west for most of my life and and thinking of spaces as like oh here are my queer spaces here are my Indian spaces I don't know how they interact I don't know like the full color and depth of of queer South Asian history, I had a better sense of like, oh, how it was the AIDS crisis in New York City. That was like the queer history I knew, but I didn't know what it looked like at all in South Asia. I didn't know the historical placement of queer and trans people in our culture, our religion, our society, our caste system. And I think that that was a big spark point where now I, I don't try to do queer organizing without a lens that doesn't take into account like the diversity of our diaspora and caste inclusivity and, and our culture and politics. Thank you so much. And I think what um, Rashi said, like that was, that's, I feel like that's something a lot of um, diaspora uh, kids, like queer kids can like can relate to that sometimes we're so disconnected from our queer history in like our homeland that we only think of it in terms of like American history, queer history. So um, our, my second, my next question is kind of primarily aimed towards Garley and Anjali. So um, you two both work as professors and within an academic uh, space. So is there an empty space in academia for queer people or people of South Asian descent? And also what have your experiences in this field been like? Gauri, do you wanna go first or do you want me to go first? Uh, I can go first. I mean, I think for me, I'll say like, I'm a junior scholar and for me, the jury's still kind of out on academia, <laughs> um, uh, especially sort of academia as a liberatory place. Um, but I am invested in, I think, the ideal of the university. And, and, and for me, which, you know, I, I probably mentioned this earlier too, that, you know, the university was a place that allowed me to uh, rethink myself and to sort of, um, and to, to get a handle on sort of what my values and, and, and uh, political ideals were. Um, and so for that, 
reason, you know, that's probably why I'm still here and why I, I love my job. Um, but, you know, I, I do think it's important to recognize the kind of material conditions of the university and how the universities we work at are often exploitative in kind of fundamental ways. Um, and I, I'm saying this, you know, I live in Boston where universities are major gentrifiers. They uh, own huge swaths of real estate. Um, they, um, and they um, are often kind of exploitative employers. Uh, and that's been really clear in the context of COVID. Um, uh, and also, you know, uh, many activists sort of gain resources through universities, right? So they can be a site of that as well. And academia is really hierarchical, right? So a lot of the people I know in Boston who do really kind of life-saving organizing work uh, in South Asian communities and queer communities um, are uh, precariously employed or not working at the most prestigious institutions or um, are non-tenure track faculty, right? So um, all of these dynamics are sort of, you know, are, are part of being in the university. So I think, you know, as we're in universities, we also need to be, um, be, be critical of the kinds of institutions they are, but also, you know, as we can see just from the fact that, you know, this panel exists, um, the university can be a generative site, um, but you know you kind of have to be mercenary and critical about how you're using it. I think um, for it to be that way. Um, thank you, Gauri. And I think Gauri's point about um, precarity and the university being a place of extractive capitalism is very, very important for us to foreground. I also want to say that. It's very um, heartening for me that this is a collaboration between a private and a public university in terms of the fact that folks from Yale and folks from UC Riverside. And I think to answer the question about academia is to also answer the question of public and private education, right? I gave up a job at a private institution to teach at a public institution because I wanted to do a different kind of labor and reach a different kind of community. I was lucky to have had that choice, not many people do. I also gave up a job in a discipline and chose to work in, in a field like feminist studies where, um, you know, let me get, tell you a joke because I'm an Indian, I gotta tell you a joke. When I teach at UC Santa Cruz, the feminist studies department is very old and when it was 25 years old, uh, it was still called women's studies and it changed to feminist studies. I bought my dad, who was my biggest fan, a t-shirt that says, 25 years of women's studies. And my dad was, you know, passed away, but he was a wonderful, glorious, gorgeous man, a poet and a mathematician. Y'all would have loved him. So Baba was always very excited to wear all the, you know, polemic t-shirts I bought him. So he wore this, so, but I gave him this t-shirt and then he never wore it. So then I went back and said, Baba, what's up, right? I gave you this t-shirt, which is 25 years of women's studies. And he said to me, look, Beta, I'm very progressive. If I wear this, my friends are going to think I studied women for 25 years, right? So I can't wear that T-shirt. Now, I'm telling you that joke because what we do is often not clear to anybody, right? So parents are always asking me, you know, what up with feminist studies? Like, what are you, is she going to get a job? Are they going to have a life after? So I think academia is both a place of possibility, but also a place of peril. How you sit in disciplines, you know, the challenges Gauri will have because she does interdisciplinary work are going to be very different for me because now I am tenured and senior. But when I was coming up for 10 years, how to make myself legible, right? I not only worked in South Asia, I didn't work on homosexuality. Right. My current book is about a history of Devadasis, but it is more queer than my first book because it is about non normative kinship. Right. So I think one of the challenges for us, uh, at least for me and I think for Gauri, um, has been is how do you make yourself legible in the way in which you want to be read? Right. I don't work on women. I don't work on bio women. I don't work on homosexuals. I work on ways of studying history that will make sexuality legible in capacious and exciting ways. Right. So that's a project that the University of California allows me to do. And those resources then allow me to collaborate and work with people in India. And I do a lot of collaborations with Ambedkar uh, unions and also with a lot of gender studies departments in India. One of the things that that I feel like we need to say is feminism.
right? Feminism is very central to any queer movement. You cannot have a queer, trans, non-binary movement without it being feminist. And when I say feminist, again, it's not an object thing. It's not about studying by women. Feminism is about inequality and inequity. So I think something that, that I often notice is that, you know, currently that has sort of fallen away, right? And I think we need to remember that the early work particularly in South Asia around queer and trans and non-binary issues came from feminists, right? Who were talking about sexuality way before we called it queer. So I want to stop there. Thank you so much for um, those insights. Like I feel, I certainly feel like I learned a lot and um, kind of jumping off that point, um, Rashka, you work primarily in the tech industry, which is kind of notoriously um, dominated by men. Do you feel any of those same um, issues or um, experiences as our other panels? Yeah, I think it's a very different space, but can also be a really similar space. Like um, what Gary was saying about exploitation and like kind of the extraction of resources and, and like the way that these industries work. It's something that's been on my mind a lot recently as a labor organizer. Um, recently in New York, the NYU grad students and the Columbia grad students are on strike right now for better working conditions because grad students are so ridiculously underpaid, especially to live in a city like New York. And, and we've been having similar kinds of organizing calls um, through tech companies as well, women who've been facing retaliation for sexual harassment and um, the, the cases in Silicon Valley against caste discrimination that the workers were facing at Cisco and such. It, it really does all tie together, like all of our, our workplaces and any of our spaces that we exist in, there is, I don't know, I feel like you'd be hard pressed to find a perfect space that, that doesn't have these kind of, these issues of exploitation and discrimination and uh, like exacerbating marginalization. So I think we're all doing our, our own work in our own realms that is like kind of strikingly similar, even though it's such different fields of work. That's what I had to, that's what both of your responses made me think of. Thank you so much. And like, I, like, I think what you said about how there's no perfect work Place. like we're all gonna have like some kind of experience of like marginalization in any workplace we go to so that's why it's important to join a union guys um also like just to kind of um continue the conversation um a lot of the attendees here in this panel are leaders in their own south asian communities like for example at uc riverside i'm one of the co-presidents of the south asian federation my other co-president is here today so um uh, what suggestions do you have for how they can advocate for queer members of our communities or like just kind of the more marginalized members of our own communities? I have so much to say about this because I just, you know, I left college like three years ago and I feel like I've been thinking about it endlessly, like what, what could have been so different. I, I, we had a large South Asian population at Georgia Tech, both people who were second generation immigrants like myself and then people who were um, from, from South Asia directly on, on student visas. And our predominant student life was for South Asian culture was so high caste North Indian centric. Like it was, we had like eight fusion dance teams and like we had like India club, but that, that like celebrated only kind of like high caste Northern style festivals all the time. And when I look back on it, I'm like that, that is not representative of the diaspora at all. That is representative of this tiny sliver of it. And we didn't, like nobody was pushing for it to be more inclusive. People had this idea of what it, what it meant to be Indian and then kind of just rolled with that agenda. And we could have done so much more to talk about whether it's queer history or Dalit history or different kinds of festivals really just pushed ourselves instead of turning it into a space that like further marginalized our own communities. Like what is the South Asian umbrella even that is such a non-nuanced umbrella, but we can bring more nuance into it and we can challenge ourselves to learn more about our histories and teach each other about our stories and histories. And, and I really wish that, that we had done that more in, in my time as a student. I would say that for me, that it has been in two ways, um, you know, as an undergraduate, which was, you know, in prehistoric times when I was doing what Raksha was doing, I was fortunate enough to be involved with a lot of anti-racist groups. And, um, 
queer politics was very central to those anti-racist groups, both when I went to undergraduate, both in the UK and in Cornell, where I, where I did engineering. But I think as a teacher, which is war the life that I lead now and have led for the past two decades, at UC Santa Cruz, where I teach, on the one hand, it's a very progressive school. Everyone's queer, you know, even before they arrive, which is fantastic. But most of the South Asian students are in science, um, STS, science and technology studies. So I teach a course called Histories of Possibility, uh, Figures of Possibility, where I do a history of mathematics and computational media and use that to think about questions of sexuality, right? So the reason I'm bringing that up is because the way to reach um, you know, South Asian students who are Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, um, uh, from Afghanistan, which is can be West Asia or South Asia, they are Christian, Buddhist, non-denominational, right? So one of the things that that I think if we want to, you know, do the kind of work that Raksha wishes she had when um, when you were an undergrad is to get them to understand that the diversity of sexuality is only possible if we understand the diversity of other components of South Asian life, right? So I give a lot of, um, you know, rabble rousing speeches to the South Asian Undergraduate Association. And for the most part, I get them to think about sexuality as not just being something queers think about. I mean, I wish it was, but we do a lot of boring stuff, right? So, so sexuality is not the domain of queer trans bodies or people like Gauri who happen to work on sexuality, right? But in fact, sexuality is about gender. Gender is about masculinity. You can't be a feminist if you don't have feminist men, right? So. Um, so this is not to say, oh, yay, we are all connected. Of course, there are inequalities and asymmetries, but you can break through, um, you know, and get people invested, right, in a question that matters to them. And how do we get out of that um, sort of in a way that's not just about identity politics, right? Meaning, I just don't want you to care about queer politics or trans politics or non-binary politics or feminist politics because you are that identity, right? You should care that Muslim men are being killed for falling in love with Hindu women, regardless of where you are, what you're doing and who you are, right? That is a queer question because it is about injustice, right? So the queer politics I try to teach students is of course provide them with sanctuary and safe spaces if they are not able to be themselves, but also remind them that this is about injustice. It's not about identity politics, because if it is, then we get slotted. Raksha is youth, uh, Gauri is ally, I'm the homo, right? Those are not what we're here for. We're here basically to say we're all messed up. We got all kinds of shades, not 50, but less, hopefully. And how do we get everyone involved? And how can we get everyone to have a stake in what we're doing? Because otherwise, we will get ghettoized, right? This group will only be for certain people and not everyone. So the question is, how do you get pe more people at the table? And I think that is something I can do. Uh, as yeah, I guess I'm sort of, you know, in in between you both in terms of my uh, time away from undergrad. I guess I, you know, for me I, and I and Raksha, I was sort of like. It's it's disappointing to hear about your experience, partly because I always hoped that things were sort of changing for and for in terms of undergraduate South Asian kind of political life and 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 your experience actually sounded quite similar to um, uh, to the to one I had um, as as an undergraduate in South Asian student spaces. Um, but I don't know. I guess I'll just say a couple of sort of like practical things um, that I have um, I've found to be useful in the last couple of years. Um, one is that I actually think uh, a lot of times there's more space for for conversations that um, that seem to be suppressed in spaces that, uh, that that are sort of waiting to to be had, right? So, um, a few years ago, uh, Brandeis added caste to its non discrimination policy, and it was. Um, a huge success, and I and I was uh, and I was part of the committee that was sort of doing research on um, how to make this happen. Um, and and as part of that, I reached out to some students who were undergrads uh, to talk about, you know, like how would this affect undergraduates? Um, and a lot of them kind of said the same thing, which was. Um, you know, we really wish our student organization would talk about caste, um, but but none of them 
none of those conversations had happened, but they were all sort of, so many students wanted them to happen, you know? And I actually think, you know, that process that was, you know, a kind of bureaucratic in some ways um, uh, stamp that, that the non-discrimination policy uh, uh, created kind of opened up some space to have some conversations. Um, uh, and another example of this is, um, you know, in the last year, one of the things I was doing with the South Asian Workers Worker Center here was um, we were doing a bunch of uh, food drives, especially during Ramadan and in, in, um, in public housing units where people were under lockdown, they weren't able to get groceries, and then the city was giving them um, giving them groceries, but they weren't kind of um, dietarily appropriate. And so, um, so that one of the things we were doing was that. So we had this relationship that was really kind of organized around this food distribution thing. Um, but then in the summer, you know, these Black Lives Matter uh, protests were happening. Uh, and we just said, let's, you know, have a session and talk about, you know, just talk about what's going on. Um, and it was just just really amazing to see sort of how many um, uh, how many things people had to say, how many thoughts they had, how many ways they kind of wanted to um, to, to think about anti-blackness in their communities. And so I, I guess I guess my point with giving you these two examples is to say that sometimes we don't have to work so hard to kind of you know if we have these different investments in our lives we can actually sort of bring them into each other and sometimes um uh, and, and, a, and a lot of times the the discussions are sort of there to be had if we're willing to open the door to them sometimes you know we can just create the space for them to unfold yeah i'll stop there <laughs> um thank you guys so much and um i really appreciate what you guys said about caste i feel like um in the diaspora we tend to pretend that caste isn't a thing anymore or we tend to ignore it. So um, I'm really glad that you brought it up and that a lot of um, South Asian orgs I've been seeing like are trying to bring up caste more and more. Like for example, we've had a lot of caste-based panels um, here at SAI. So hopefully this like momentum keeps going. And I kind of want to move on to the next question. Um, Anjali, you kind of brought up how um, queer politics is kind of the politics of injustice. Um, you all want to kind of talk a little bit more about how um, the politics, like the intersection of politics and sexuality and queerness kind of all interact a little bit and how they can all be so entwined. Well, I mean, when I say queer politics must be a politics of eradicating injustice, it means that, um, you know, why we use, why I use the term queer instead of LGBTQ and so on is not to, to put one against the other, but to sort of say, what does the word queer allow me to do? How does it allow me to define myself? And what does it allow me to draw attention to, right? And I think some of the things that, that, that for example, I work with a very big umbrella organization of activists uh, across the world, but for there are about 25 organizations in Europe and about similar number of organizations um, in the United States under the category of the Gather, uh, which is of course uh, a shout out to the Gather movement. And most of the people who are in there are Raksha's age, right? And they're mostly tech people. And they are mostly the folks who are helping us forge um, you know, different sets of rights through their ability to uncover, for example, if you've been following what's going on in India, people like me and my comrades have been arrested in the Bhima Koregaon case in Maharashtra, where a lot of anti-caste activists have been brutalized and incarcerated by the state. Now, what is less known is that many of those anti-caste activists are also queer. Right. But if you look at what is going on in the media, you would never know that. Right. And part of what um, our, the, the, this massive organization that I work with has been doing is providing the support. Right. So, for example, the, the Indian government has claimed that they're anti-national because they found these files on their computers that had naxalite or anti-national uh, propaganda. Now, with our help uh, and these forensic uh, uh, sort of computing experts, we have managed to prove now that those files were actually planted on the laptops of these anti-activists, I mean, sorry, anti-caste activists, and therefore now the state has had to give them bail, etc. Now, 
Why is this a queer project? Because this is a queer project, because it is about suppression. It is about the violation of the right to freedom. And it is about a, a kind of escalated inequity that is unfolding in India that we need to put our step down on, right? Now, it's also very strategic. When I speak at these organizations, and I have given testimony now in the last year to parliaments in Australia, in the European Union, but I rarely identify myself as a queer person. And obviously, this is not because I don't want to be queer. Uh, you know, anyone who takes one look at my profile will know. It's because I am trying to center something else, right? As one of my teachers used to say, make sure people do not hear what they see, right? Which is to say what? You don't assume that just because I'm a, I'm a queer person, I'm going to only talk about sexuality. Because I'm a queer person, I'm going to tell you that sexuality exists in all institutional, intellectual, and activist forms. And it's important for us to do that. So one of the biggest challenges I've had is most, a lot of anti-caste activists are very masculinist, right? They're not interested in gender politics or sexual politics. Uh, and there's a lot of concern about the fact that if you bring that up, it will dilute the caste project, anti-caste project. So I think when I say queer politics is about injustice, it's about moving promiscuously. Um, I can pick up from there. I mean, I think, so this question about sort of what, um, how sex is, how sexuality and politics are intertwined, I think is one that I've thought about um, a lot in my research because in sociology, uh, the discipline I was trained in, you know, politics usually means kind of the state or social movements, right? Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, as I start, started to, in graduate school and beyond, kind of read queer and feminist theory, you know, you start to see how um, sexuality and gender and caste and race and all of these dynamics sort of um, are all, you know, intertwined with the state and social movements in a lot of ways, right? So um, the idea of the state, the authority of the state is upheld by ideas of sexuality. Um, uh, the state regulates uh, what kinds of sex are good and bad and how we talk about sex and you know where we can have sex and, and who, who, who can have good sex um, and all of these kind of questions that I think uh, Raksha, you've also written, you know, written about. Um, and I loved reading some of your writing about uh, about this. Um, I'll also say, I mean, I think, um, you know, and I'm saying this partly because because of the the university location of of this conversation we're having. Um, U.S. based universities actually have kind of a particular role in kind of how sexuality is defined and 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 the language that's used to talk about sexuality and and given authority through kind of these NGO circuits that Raksha was talking about and you know I'll just give you one example recent example um, that relates to kind of COVID and AIDS because it's what I write about um, uh, soon after the the uh, COVID pandemic uh, had hit. Um, there were some Harvard and Yale medical researchers who did a study um, that was really, I think, based on kind of like statistical models. Uh, and based on that research, they made the recommendation that red light districts closing in Indian, uh, in Indian cities would, I, I can't remember the number, but it would kind of drastically change the course of the COVID pandemic. And of course, we know, you know, that this is part of a history of, you know, and uh, of why sexuality is sort of at the heart of anxieties about disease and pandemic and nation, right? Why do you think that because, you know, there's this pandemic happening that everybody at risk of, is at risk of that you need to focus on sex workers and red light districts, right? There is something there um, that, that really kind of captures how sexuality becomes an index of so many other things. Um, and, you know, th this was a study that was done out of Harvard and Yale, right? And so, um, you know, from our location here in universities, we actually have a sort of, you know, interesting location from which to push on how that knowledge is produced because the knowledge has real consequences. So activists 
um, in India were saying at this time that, you know, sex workers were getting harassed more by the police because that research, which wasn't even peer reviewed yet, had been reported in the English language media and then in vernacular media, right? So, uh, and the police were saying, you're a risk, you're a COVID risk, like, you know, and, and, and sex workers are always abused by police. Um, but, you know, this was just another pretext for that. Um, so I think that's just kind of one example of how the, these knowledge circuits are tied to, to power and politics. And, and, and I use the example also because I think it gives us a way of thinking about, you know, how as, as part of universities or being a university adjacent, we can kind of potentially intervene in that. So um, activists in India, um, sex worker activists in India kind of wrote um, a letter that was signed by allies across the world um, that, um, I don't think still has the, the, you can still find the study online. So it, it hasn't really had the effect that I think it should have had, but, um, but you know, there was a response and it came from kind of um, sex workers who, um, uh, who, whose lives were affected by the production of this knowledge. So anyway, I'll stop there, but thank you. <laughs> um, I don't have a ton to, to add on this topic, uh, but I, I'm writing a piece right now where I'm collecting some of the labor history of our um, union at Google. And so much of our labor organizing has been spearheaded by queer and trans people. And that was kind of a surprise to me to, to kind of unearth that, that history under our movement and, and realize that people who are already living on the margins are, are going to be the people who are, you know, fighting for for the wrongs to be righted in a way. And I think that's been a very interesting eye-opening experience for me. Like, I think that sexuality and, and marginalization goes so much further than, than, you know, our limited context of it in so many other ways. Um, speaking of which, I actually have to hop off to a union call right now. And this has been really wonderful. It's been really humbling to be on this panel. And I really hope that you guys all stay in touch. Please reach out if you have anything else for me. Thank you so much for um, coming. Um, since we have to go, we'll let you go. But um, since we are reaching the end of our um, allotted time, if our other two panelists or panelists are okay with staying a little bit longer, we do have one audience question. So if that's all right with you guys. And then um, Raksha, before you go, if you could just drop like where to find you or um, just anything like that, like go ahead and put it in the chat. So um, our one audience question is from Marwa, and she asks, what would the panelists say to people who are stuck in a place that won't move from the stigma built up for decades around the LGBT community, people who are trying to come out or fighting for these, but also have a lot of internalized um, phobias? Um, there is no uh, simple answer to that question. I think, um, you know, first, I would say that if you are in a home or a place that is not safe for you, you need to find a community or a place of refuge that is not that place. And it is not your job to undo decades of homophobia, right? It is your job first to make sure that you're okay and that you're able to survive. And in that process, if you're able to undo some decades of, of homophobia, that is great. So I would say that, you know, one of the, the challenges of, you know, and, and what you're describing, unfortunately, is way too familiar to me because I have had over the past two decades, hundreds and hundreds of South Asian students come to me uh, with the same questions. And um, the way I've addressed that question is to say that every case is different. And also, you know, make sure you don't underestimate your kin either, right? So that your parents may surprise you or your parents may, may not surprise you or hurt you, but you have to sort of understand that there is no set story that you can tell of your coming out as well. And also it is not your job to educate uh, everyone. It is your job to take care of yourself, to educate yourself. And then if you're fortunate enough to have come through that in one piece, then to use that knowledge to help others. And I can give you very specific examples as well, but I want to hear from Gauri too, because we both deal with 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 young people in different ways so yeah i mean i think i i i probably i probably usually use a similar combination of strategies right which is like i i do think 
I, I do think keeping yourself safe is the most important priority. And I do think that a lot of times um, you may just need to kind of create space for yourself that's away from the violence of, uh, and, and even the kind of like micro violences of a, a family, but also I, I really like the advice of don't underestimate your family, right? Um, because I think a lot of times, um, and I, I think growing up in a community where like all of the uncles and aunties knew each other, I, I used to, I used to be really frustrated by my friends who lied to their parents because I just thought you're actually making it worse for everybody else by, by compartmentalizing your life like this, right? And I wondered if, you know, if we all sort of um, trusted that we could at least try to have conversations with our families as as full people and as and about every aspect of our lives that we might actually sort of uh, create more space for each other. But of course, that has to happen within the bounds of what make what uh, what you're safe doing, right? So it's it's a complicated prospect, and I have a privileged position in that, so I have a very particular kind of. Um, a, a perspective on it. Um, but I do think this matters also for sort of how we think about, you know, the so-called more public sites of, of activism, right? Because, um, you know, not everybody is safe speaking in a public forum and not everybody wants to be doing that or wants to be placed in a particular box or bucket or labeled in a specific way or, or asked to speak for specific issues. Uh, and I think that's something we've talked about on this panel already, um, but that does sort of mean that there is, there is a role for critical, um, critical solidarity, right? And for people who don't necessarily see an issue as their issue to, um, to engage, right? And to not kind of stand by and let the people who seem like it's their issue or their topic um, to, to bear the burden of that, right? And so I think for me, that's been a practice that's um, that's been especially apparent um, uh, in, in my work with uh, people who do sex work um, is sort of uh, recognizing those, uh, the, the, that uh, relationship between kind of the visibility that certain forms of politics often demand and the kind of uh, identity recognition strategies that are often called uh, called for, but but not possible for many people. Uh, and so I, I think that that makes, you know, uh, and I'm not saying that um, uh, these play out in the same way for everybody, but I do think they're really important to keep in mind. Um, and I think it's particularly, you know, as as we um, as we engage in sort of the multidimensionality of our identities, it's particularly important. Um, but also, I mean, and the other thing I'll say about this is that we also need to be thinking about the politics of care within those political spaces, right? So, um, you know, how to sustain ourselves. And I don't mean like, you know, self-care, like going and getting a massage in the service of like capitalism or something. I actually mean like caring for each other is part of politics too. Um, so for what it's worth, you know, I, I think those, um, those relationships can be really vital, especially in this time. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for answering that question. I think that's a question a lot of us kind of struggle with. And also thank you for Mara for um, submitting that question. Since we are like very close to the end of our time, if our panelists would like to have any closing statements and also maybe um, tell us where we can find them or any work to look out for them for, um, you, can, you guys can go ahead and make that now and then Socket can end the meeting. And hopefully you guys can come to any of our other um, events today. Yeah, I don't really have any parting words of wisdom, except that I would say, you know, as someone who studies the past, that history is about repetition and rupture, right? What that means is that, you know, it's not like capitalism arrived with the white people. There was greed before they arrived. But what was different <laughs> after they came? What did they, what different sets of, of capital extractive processes did they start? So also, as someone who studies the long history of sexuality, we all know everybody was having a good time for a very long time, right? But what happened in the 18th century in India that made certain practices um, problematic and others not, right? Was it about um, the, the minoritization of homosexual trans bodies or was it about something else? So I think one of the things I would urge you to do is that, 
um, you know, because history is not something that you study in books or outside of you, it is affecting everybody, right? Uh, the fact that the first thing that the Hindu right does all over the world, remember, it is the richest right wing organization in the world, the RSS, right? This is a fact. So it, the richest right wing organization in the world, what it does is spread a wrong understanding of history so that we cannot say that we have existed, all of us, in all kinds of shapes and sizes for a very long time. The first thing that they did in California was try to change the textbooks, right? The first thing that they're trying to do in India is make it impossible for people like me to do my research because it will be anti-national, right? So uh, if you are in school right now, you need to demand those kinds of histories as part of your knowledge process, right? So I would say, as, as a teacher, that would be my request and appeal to you is to think about history as a repetition with rupture. So yes, white people were scary back then, they're scary back now, but yes, they're scary differently. And why are they scary differently now than they were before, right? I'm, I'm being facetious, but I think you all get my point, right? So it's important for us to be dexterous about those places of possibility and peril. I don't think I can top that as a closing remark. <laughs> and I know we're out of time. Um, but I guess I'll just say really quickly, I mean, based on what I've, um, what I've learned in my research on AIDS is that, um, and I use the this, this word articulation a lot in my book. And uh, articulation is, is a word that means kind of how you talk about something, right, but also how you make a connection between two things. And, you know, what I found was that activists were able to articulate what it means to, to live um, with or die from AIDS in a variety of ways, right? And, and it was the work of activists that made AIDS an issue of um, uh, moral policing or caste oppression or capitalism, right? And, and that wasn't how um, AIDS was initially understood, right? And, it, and it, it's an incomplete project. I'm not being celebratory about it, um, but it was, um, it was the work of political articulation to make an issue uh, what it was. So I think that's that's kind of one of the insights I think from my research that I often come back to is sort of how there is that room to uh, to connect or tether different kind of um, political uh, issues together. And I think in the current moment in India, it just seems particularly important because of um, the attack that's really sort of so widespread and on so many different um, uh, different forms of life and different kind of, uh, and, and the, the definition of anti-national is sort of so all encompassing in so many ways. Um, so I guess I'll leave it at that, but I'm, I, I'm so uh, inspired and grateful to all of you for creating this space to have this discussion. Um, 